Got it. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Am I on? You're on. Come on. <laughs> well, good morning and welcome to United Presbyterian Church on this absolutely beautiful Sunday morning. Um, we do have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, the flowers this morning are placed by Garrett and Vera Heitink in loving celebration of their mothers. Uh, so you can see them here. Uh, our studies are up and running again, so if you would like to come to Bible study, we have two options for you, and both are on Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday at 1215, we are studying the book, or the letter to the Roman church from Paul, and we had just started, so it's a great time to jump in, and at 6 o'clock on Tuesday evenings, we are studying uh, John's Gospel. I think we're about six chapters in, but you know what, in either case, it's always good to jump in whenever. There's plenty of great stuff uh, in both uh, areas. And then on Sunday mornings, of course, our pastor's class, which is at 845. And we are uh, working on Reformed theology, uh, specifically working through the book Christian Doctrine by Shirley Guthrie. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other announcements that we can make this morning. Oh, uh, yes, there'll be no confirmation class next Sunday. Uh, because we have um, the event uh, with the kids talking about uh, camp and buckhorn, and so uh, 
can't do two things at once. So uh, we'll take a hiatus from class next Sunday. All right. And Alan? If you ordered script last week, you can uh, pick it up um, from me or Stephanie in Fellowship Hall today. And um, the ethnic food fair sign-up sheets are in the narthex. And, <clears throat> oh, I was asking, um, Kiwanis Club is hosting a sneak preview of a, uh, uh, the concert at Fairview Methodist Church, which will be the 26th. It'll be this Thursday. And yes, it's open to everybody here. Details are in the bulletin if you want to read them one of the flyers, and it's to benefit the Fairview Elementary School's literacy and artful learning programs. Where is it going to be held, Alan? At Fairview Methodist Church. So the uh, green sheet, I mean, it looked like it was going to be at our church as well. No, the no. Kiwanis Club thing on Thursday. The Kiwanis Club was Thursday here? Yes. Okay, thank you. I was confused. Um, okay. Any other announcements? I would like to welcome uh, Colin Lewis, who is our guest clarinet, uh, clarinet player, and uh, our new music director, uh, Benjamin Watkins. Christian man is also the most distinguished patriarch of the first 175 years of the United Presbyterian Church. UPC's roots made it Brian's church from birth to death at 95. From his days as young Will Bryan, through his decision to predate modern Moors by changing his middle name from the Christian Julian to Lowe when, in 1889, he married his life partner, Charlotte Lowe. He then became William Lowe Bryan. The building at Ninth College was his church 
through his record 35-year presidency of IU, through years when he taught Sunday school and uh, preached some funerals uh, as the pillar of the church, through the 1951 fire, through its relocation here at 2nd Nisai. At 91, he and his 100-year-old sister, Mary Phillips, turned the first shovels of dirt for construction of the new church. <clears throat> Brian's father, John, had been pastor of a UPC Root Church, Associate Presbyterian, for five years when son William was born in 1860. Young Will was homeschooled in the classics by his parents. He joined the IU faculty after graduation in 1884. He's the most recent <coughs> IU president whose undergraduate degree was from the school, the only IU president who was born and raised in Monroe County, and the only one who won an IU athletic letter, baseball. Thomas Clark devoted virtually the entire second book of his four-volume history of the university to the Bryan years, <clears throat> during which enrollment rose from 1,300 to 10,000. He led IU to its most significant victory ever over Purdue, prevailing through the courts, the legislature, the press, and the court of public opinion to establish the IU Medical School. Clark credited Bryan with making IU a university in fact, funding, staffing, and developing a vast expansion that includes the present schools of music, business, journalism, and the basic graduate school system. Clark wrote that it was Bryan's vision, dogged determination, and loyalty to standards that projected IU into the future. Bryan's years <clears throat> span the worst crises in city, state, and university history, continual water shortages, World War I, the national flu epidemic in the late 1910s, the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, and the Great Depression in the 30s. He led in the upgrading and expansion of faculty, facilities, and economic departments, and the integration of women and African Americans into the student body and faculty. He inherited IU's turn-of-the-century entry into today's Big Ten, providing the Fieldhouse Stadium and other facilities for the greatly upgraded athletic program that conference membership necessitated. Through it all, he was a practicing, example-setting Christian whose faith showed up regularly in his frequent speeches and his almost daily columns on the front page of the Indiana Daily Student. His popularity, like that of his successor Herman B. Wells, was universal among students and faculty. Brian died November 21st, 1955. His funeral was at his home with UPC Pastor Franklin McAllister in charge and Wells as a speaker. Bloomington honors his memory with Bryan Street and Bryan Park. And since 1937, the IU President's Office has been in Bryan Hall. At Fellowship Hour today, Lou's gonna to give us a tour of the United Presbyterian Cemetery that was founded in the uh, 1830s and I think you'll find that very interesting. I hope to see you at Fellowship Hour. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Give thanks to God. Call upon God's name. Seek God's strength and God's presence. Praise God for God's guidance and commandments. Praise God for all God's deeds. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn is number 464, so please stand if you are able.
and now the passing of the peace, the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share that peace with one another.
is your, well, let me ask you a question. Do you know what the word aroma means? I'll give you a hint. If mom is baking cookies or dad is baking cookies, yes, very good. The smell, right? In the old cartoons, the old Bugs Bunny, sometimes you would see the aroma come out like this with a hand and <laughs> guide the Looney Tune towards the feast. Yeah. So when we think of aromas, what is your favorite? What's your favorite smell? Nothing? You have some least, well, we'll keep those for outside of church. <laughs> Mine is pizza. <laughs> Nothing like pizza. Baking in an oven, and you just smell it wafting in the air. Yeah, that will bring me into a restaurant every time. What's your favorite? Oh, pancakes? No. <laughs> that would be my son, too. He loves pancakes. So today in our message, Paul talks about fragrances and aromas. And he talks about the church in that we give off a fragrance or an aroma. Now, of course, this is a metaphor, right? Paul, well, unless Paul says, you know, you don't use too much enough deodorant, right? But Paul is using it as a metaphor, saying what type of aroma or what type of fragrance should the church give off? And what he's talking about is if we imitate the life of Christ, we will give off an aroma that is beautiful, that will draw people to the church, that will draw people to the understanding of Jesus. And he uses the example of the old sacrificial system of the Hebrews when they would burn offerings and the smells would waft up into the heavens and please God. And so our aromas, what we do as Christians, how we treat each other, how we treat our neighbors, how we are seen by the world, acts as an aroma. And the aroma should please God in how we act, in how we treat one another, in how we treat our neighbors. Because if we want to put off a good aroma, a fragrance that is pleasing to God, we should follow some of these things that Paul talks about. So in today's section, it, it's been called by some as Paul's Beatitudes, as Paul is saying these are the attitudes we should take on. That we should be kind to one another, that we should be good, we should put away all false truths and live a life that is pleasing to Christ as we have the Spirit of God within us. So when we think about how we should live and how we should treat each other and how we should be seen by our neighbors, let us think of it as an aroma that is pleasing to God when we live our life as Christ desires us to live. So let us put off a pleasing aroma, like a pizza baking in an oven that makes you happy and puts a smile on your face. Let us give off an aroma that is pleasing to God. That way we know we are following Christ's teachings into our world. Let us. Heavenly Lord, we are thankful we are thankful for Paul and for Paul's letter. We are thankful for the instruction, for the help, and for the illustration that we should live our lives as a pleasing aroma to God. Let us do so, pleasing God in all we do, by following and living out the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, today's song is number one, Jesus Love.
please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Faithful God, we confess that our doubts and insecurities have often kept us from doing what we know is right. You do not abandon us, and yet we are often too busy to recognize your presence with us. You have taught us your will and way, and yet we often want to take the law into our own hands, do our own thing. You have called us to reach out in faith, but we lack the courage. Hold us down, restore our faith, give us confidence to do your will in this world. Forgive us and use us, us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. And now the assurance of pardon. God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which God loved us, even when we were dead through our sin, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Amen. Our first scripture reading is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 28, and it's printed in page 892 of your pew Bible and the large print 1802. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. The word of the Lord. Picking up from verse 29, also from chapter 4. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Aromas are an important part of our world. And no aroma beats the smell of fresh donuts being baked. I can still smell those heavenly glazed beauties, even now. As the great philosopher Homer Simpson said, mmm, donuts. I remember during my time in seminary, my friends and I would spend many nights in Atlanta. And as we would drive back on Ponce, or Ponce de Leon, we just called it Ponce, lies one of the holiest shrines in all Atlanta. And Sue is laughing because I think she knows where I'm going. The Krispy Kreme, right? And when the donuts and the Krispy Kreme are being made, there's this wonderful little neon sign that pops in, these, in this orange fury. And it says, hot. But you don't need the sign because you can actually smell it even from the road. In your car, the aroma permeates. And when the aroma hit, I don't care who was in the car, 
how many lanes of traffic you had to zip through, you would risk your life to get into that Krispy Kreme and eat about 12 dozen donuts, or maybe one or two donuts. You know, when we think about aromas, they are very powerful, right? A lot of researchers say that smell is the strongest of the senses tied to memory. So when we deal with our lesson this morning, the aroma that the church is supposed to give off is a call to action. In his letter to the church, Paul charges the congregation. It's a list, but not of do and don'ts, rules and regulations, deep. He calls the church to deeper love with God and a call to action for social justice, very similar to Jesus' call in the Sermon on the Mount. It is a call to leave the old life and embrace a new life, Christ-like. Old habits must be dropped and new ones must be picked up. So let's take a closer look at Paul's Beatitude. It says, put away falsehood, speaking only truth to our neighbors. As we are members of one another, brothers and sisters, we're actually one. What we do to each other, we do to ourselves. He says, you know, it's okay to be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger making room for the devil. Paul's talking about righteous anger. You would need more than two hands to count all the times that Jesus was upset with the religious leaders and powers and principalities. You'd have to take off your shoes and start counting your toes as well. And who could forget the temple? Right? Anger, which is selfish and unbridled, is selfish and hurtful. This is what Paul is banning from the Christian life. But it is selfless anger, which is disciplined into the service of Christ and the service of each other, our neighbors, to push for justice for others, is one of the great dynamic forces of this world, allowing that fire to be built in your stomach because you see something that is wrong and you want to fix it. Paul warns the church, don't go to bed angry. It's good to deal with these quarrels. Don't let them turn into grudges. This is my favorite line. He advises thieves to hang it up and work honestly. Why? Well, so they have something to share with the needy. I love that line. He's saying, you know what? Hang up these bad trades of yours. Come on. Find an earnest way to make a living. Then you can give some of that back. He's encouraging honest work, but not for the individual's sake but for those who are in need, a charge to give back to one's community. <clears throat> if you don't have anything nice to say, well then don't say it. Paul warns to say things that only build others up, not to break them down. Allowing one's words to give, God, to give God's grace to those who hear them. Do not return evil evil. And Paul is not the only one that, that talks about, be careful what we say, think of the epistle James writes. I mean, ooh, he calls the tongue an, uh, an unbridled evil. <laughs> Just, so be careful how we talk to each other, right? Because think of who we represent. It's not just in church that we represent Christ, but it's outside these walls. It's in our workplaces. It's in the supermarkets. It's 
It's when we drive our cars. It's how we treat people. Allow everything we say to give glory to God. Turn away from the old life and move toward Christ. A life anew. <coughs> a turn that includes being kind to one another, being tender-hearted, and being forgiving as Christ has forgiven them. You see how it really does sound like Beatitudes? It does. Paul advises to follow these Beatitudes without grieving the Holy Spirit. Now this is a great sentence because theologians have hammered this one for centuries. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? One commentary writes on Paul's statement about grieving the Holy Spirit. It says, Paul urges us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the guide of life. When we act against the counsel of our parents when we are young, we hurt them. Similarly, to act against the guidance of the Holy Spirit is to grieve the Spirit and to hurt the heart of God. The Father, who through the Spirit sent His Word to us. The Spirit's work within us, within the church, is described in the Bible as being this gentle presence of God. Not pushing us, not forcing us to do things, but encouraging us. Gently prodding us. We are no marionettes. We are no puppets. As the Spirit guides, we have the opportunity to follow. But we can still do and go as we please. And when we do that, we grieve the Spirit, as Paul says. A grieving that wishes us to come back to follow Christ's teachings. And live as we are supposed to live as the church. Our section closes with an image from ancient Jewish culture and tradition. Paul desires the church of Ephesus to be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And this is the image we get as, as Paul closes this section. We get the image as the Levitical priest sacrificed and made burnt offerings to God. Imagine, if you will, the temple. And as your unblemished animals are burnt and offered up, as the aroma of the sacrificial animal as a smoke billowed, it was a fragrant offering to God. According to Paul, the actions and the lives of the Ephesians are to be like that. They are to be like a fragrant offering to God, giving off this by living as we should be living, following the teachings of Christ, allowing the guidance of the Holy Spirit to guide us. So gently, moving the church forward. And as we do that, as the Ephesians do that, they are moving in the proper direction, giving off that aroma as they should, like the Levitical priest as a sacrifice to God. Now, Paul's advice to the ancient Ephesians is so very much applicable to us, the church in the 21st century, the church in the postmodern world, the church here in Bloomington, Indiana. Paul's beatitude should be something that the church should strive to follow and to achieve. Much like the beatitudes of Jesus, they are given for a reason. Jesus' beatitudes are not, it's not a legal list, a rigid rule, rules of do's and don'ts, and neither are Paul's here. Paul is encouraging the church, these are the attitudes you should pick up. If you want to have a pleasing aroma to God, do these things. If you don't want to grieve God's spirit, do these things. I implore you. 
Are there things as Christians that we should be angry over? How do we treat our neighbors? Do we as individuals care enough for the needy? Are we free from bitterness, malice, and wrath? Do all the words come out of our mouths build and not destroy? Yeah, the words from Paul apply to us as well. They most definitely do. There are many injustices in our world today. And we fall short of the list that Paul has comprised for the Ephesian church. Because Paul gives the church at Ephesus, it's a call. And just like Jesus' calls, they're calls to action. Right? Christianity is a very, it's an active faith. We're not called to just come hang out in some compound and talk about how we are different than the world and lock ourselves in away from everybody else. There are calls to action. Jesus' Beatitudes are calls to action. And Paul's Beatitudes here in the letter to the church in Ephesus is, are also a call to action. He just doesn't say them just to hear himself speak. They are being placed on paper that they are to inspire this community of faith there in Ephesus. It is a charge that challenged those first century Christians to do more for the social well-being of society. And as we sit here in Bloomington some 2,000 years later reading the Ephesians mail, the same charge applies to us. As long as there are hungry, poor, broken in spirit, unloved, marginalized, oppressed, vulnerable, the least of these, as Jesus coined the term. Paul's charge to the first century church will be applicable today. So go and care for your neighbors. Go and care for each other. Go and imitate the life of Christ. Go and do not grieve God's spirit. Live the teachings of our Lord and accept the guidance of God's lead. To God be all the glory, honor, and praise this day and every day. Amen. All right, at this point within our worship, um, we have a wonderful opportunity to install and ordain some new church officers. So I would like to invite Edie Peacher and Patrick and Agatha Niarco to come forward. And Don, would you also come forward? Representing the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, the session of United Presbyterian Church uh, now ordains and installs to the office of deacon Patrick and Agatha Niarco. And the session also installs to active service uh, Edie Peter, who has been previously ordained uh, as an elder within a former congregation. All right, so, trusting in the gracious mercies of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world, do you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love, do you? I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love, will you? I will. 
All right. And here are the constitutional questions. And this, these first apply to Edie, and then, actually, let's see here. These actually apply to both, and then we'll ask one to the deacon, so Patrick and Agatha, and then a question specifically to Edie. All right. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all, head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the holy and unique authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Okay. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, my favorite, imagination, and love. Will you? Okay. Now this is to the deacons of the Patrick and Agatha. Will you, be a faith, will you be faithful deacons, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Okay. And to Edie? Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Okay. And to the members of the church, do we accept Patrick and Agatha as deacons and... Edie as an elder, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? We do. We do. Excellent. All right. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for your steadfast faithfulness to us. In every age, you have called forth leaders to serve you and equip them with your gifts. Among your people, Israel, you anointed prophets, priests, and rulers. You have called pastors and teachers, bishops, elders, and deacons to build up your church. With Moses, the 70 elders, alongside the apostles, the deacons cared for all in need and guarded the community's peace. In the church, deacons and elders and pastors serve together so that your whole people may be equipped for ministry and build up into the full unity of Christ. God of grace, we pour your spirit upon Patrick and Agatha, that they may be faithful deacons in the church. Give them the openness to the Holy Spirit's leading, that they may see and serve wherever there is need. Train them in the school of prayer, that they may express the compassion of Christ to the poor and friendless, sick and grieving, and the troubled. Equip them with courage to bear the gospel into the halls of power, and to communicate your presence and might among those who are powerless. God of grace, pour out your spirit upon Edie Peter, that she may be your faithful elder in the church, giving her prudence and sound judgment, wisdom and courage to order the life of the church in obedience to your word. Nourish her in the life of the Holy Spirit, that they may exercise the ministry of discipline with humility and compassion, guiding her in governance on this session and in every court of the church, that she may be 
a servant leader following Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and give his life to set others free. Okay, at this point, I would like to invite all ordained uh, people to come forward. And you do practice the limb hands. So if you have been an ordained elder or a deacon, please come forward. Okay, Patrick, Agatha, and Edie, you are now deacons and elders in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry, that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Let us pray. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious Discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us greet our new installed and ordained officers. Thank you. Thank you. As a minister, that installing and ordaining elders and deacons makes me very happy. That and new membership always proves to me that the church is alive and well and God is still calling people, men and women, to active duty. All right, um, it's now time for the cares and concerns of our church. And so as Christ implores, what lies heavy upon your hearts this morning? What joys do you have that you'd like to share with one another? I would like to uh, start off by adding um, Patty Lucas. Uh, she had called me this morning and asked for prayer. She has been suffering from some pretty severe migraines. So let's pray for Patty. And please continually pray for my aunt, uh, Suzanne Stevo. Um, she is having a procedure on the 24th of this month uh, to remove some cancer. What other prayers or joys that you'd like to make? Yes, Don. Our daughter Liz's uh, hip replacement surgery was <coughs> successful. She is now in rehab at uh, Meadowood. I just want to thank everyone for their prayers and well wishes. Thank you, Don. Any other prayers? Yes, Sue. Her grandson, Robbie. 
likely the fairest to include conversations between the two, the two or three or six, however many doctors he has. They don't seem to check with one another, and they're doing their own thing, and they need to be working together. Y-O-U-N-G? Right. And then um, Betty uh, sent me a card, and she's traveling to her sons in St. Louis, so won't be here for the next couple of Sundays, so we should just keep her in our travel party. So she's traveling to St. Louis? We're going through some transitions with Johnny with uh, daycare. So just, again, keep us in your prayers. Yes, Bob. Just the gratitude for the uh, glorious beginning of the Benjamin era. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> Welcome. And he wasn't even supposed to play today. And he, he jumped right in. Right, He jumped right in the deep end. <laughs> so uh, we're very thankful that we were willing to do that. Let's open our conversation prayer with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Lord, we are so thankful for all you do for us. We are especially thankful that you are still calling women and men to serve your churches, that we are still ordaining and installing men and women to serve in your church. We are thankful for Agatha and Patrick who are willing to serve on our uh, diaconate we are uh, thankful for Edie, who is willing uh, to join uh, our session and, uh, and sit as an elder. Uh, without governance, there would be, it would be very hard to sustain the church. So we can't do it without the hard work and without the inspiration and imagination of the men and women who are willing to serve. So we are grateful for these three individuals this morning willing to step in and join the ranks of the other deacons and elders here at United Presbyterian Church. Lord, we thank you for so much. We thank you for the Apostle Paul who wrote to the Ephesian church to inspire them to be greater than what they were, to inspire them to seek, to love with gentleness, to care for their own community and care for those outside their community. Lord, we, we have, there's so much inspiration that comes to us. Let us follow Paul's Beatitudes as we follow Christ's Beatitudes to try to make this world a better place, one person at a time. Lord, we just ask that you hear our prayers as we pray for people around our world. We ask for prayers for those who live in lands that are torn by war or civil unrest. Lands that have, are dealing with drought or famine. We pray for those who live in lands 
where apartheid is still real, where people are dehumanized, where people who are oppressed. We know as a God that you hear their cries and that they do not fall upon deaf ears. Allow champions to rise, to care for those most vulnerable. Lord, we lift up our nation, and as always, we pray for those people who are, their position is to care for us. We pray for our president, we pray for the courts, we pray for those men and women who enforce and enact laws. Uh, we just ask that they be fair and just to all people living within our land. We pray for those living overseas, whether in the military or the Peace Corps or on your mission field. It is lonely to be away from friend and family. Allow your presence to be felt. Lord, we lift up prayers for those who are hurting, those who are recovering from surgery, those who are dealing with illness, those who struggle with depression or anxiety, those who are broken in spirit. We lift them up to your care. Lord, we lift up this congregation. And as always, <coughs> we want you to be involved within our daily life. And Lord, as we are about to lift up our own concerns, our own joys, we are encouraged because we know that you hear them. We know that you care about each and every one of us. We know that you care about this community of faith as you do each community of faith throughout our world. And we say, Lord, please hear our prayers as we lift them up to you. We lift up Patty Lucas as she is struggling with migraines this morning. We just ask that she receive some relief from the pain. We lift up my aunt Suzanne uh, who is going undergo surgery on the 24th of this month. We just ask that you be with her oncologist and the surgeons and nurses and doctors that they are able to remove everything they're looking to remove and that she can be on the mend and, um, and be healthy. We are thankful that Liz's surgery has gone well and was successful. We just ask that you be with her as she is in Meadowood, as she is receiving um, her physical therapy, that, sh that her hip can remain strong and healthy, and that, um, that the rehab takes its, takes its place and does what it is designed to do. We are thankful that her surgery went well. Lord, we ask you to be with Robbie, Sue and Bob's grandson, who is still having problems. And uh, we just ask that in, in a time where there are so many specialists and so many doctors that care for us, that they get together and, and understand what each of them, each other is, is looking to do and just to make sure that they're all on the same page um, because caring for Ravi obviously is the ultimate goal. So be with them all throughout this process. We lift up these prayers as well. We lift up Danny, a high school friend of Lou who has had a stroke. We just ask you to be with Danny and his loved ones that he is able to recover from the stroke. Um, and get some rest, but also um, to do the rehabilitation um, that he is able to get back uh, to the way he was or close to it. We lift up the young family who lost uh, what would be their matriarch um, as a, a friend who works with the cemetery um, uh, business with Lou. We just ask that as this family grieves, that they celebrate her life and what she has meant to this family and allow her memory to live on within each of them. We also pray for Betty as she is traveling with her son to St. Louis. We just ask that he has, uh, they have traveling mercies to St. Louis and then that she uh, come back safe, back to her home. Uh, we, uh, my wife and I ask for prayers for patience as we deal with transitions with our son. Um, just ask you to be with us and just uh, help us to make uh, the correct decisions. And finally, we lift up prayers of joy as uh, Benjamin is starting his call here, his service here. We just ask that his, uh, his time here is fruitful and, and well received.
and that uh, as he is here serving us, let us uh, make sure that we are serving him as well. And we just ask that he has a, a, a fruitful, pleasant, and um, a healthy music ministry here at United Presbyterian Church. Lord, we are thankful for so many things. We are thankful that you came into this world not just to grant us eternal life, but to teach us how to live, to teach us what it means to be a human, a brother and sister to us all. Allow us to understand that we are one family. Allow us to treat each other as such. And as we prepare to close this prayer, let us use the words that our Lord and Savior taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have come to the point within our worship service where we are able to give back a portion of which God has so generously given to us. Freely as you have been given, freely give. Mm -hmm. kingdom now and your kingdom yet to be revealed. In loving prayer, we thank you. Amen. Please remain standing as we prepare to sing our closing hymn for our worship service, um, How Great Thou Art, hymn number 467.
As we prepare to leave the sanctuary and re-enter our community, let us go and take with us Paul's Beatitudes that we found within his letter to the church to Ephesus. Let us go and try to be a pleasing aroma as a church, following his guidance and not grieving God's spirit, <clears throat> being good to one another, imploring each other to be good, not only to members of the church, but to our neighbors outside. Because sometimes this might be the only God or reference point to God that people might ever see. And we want to leave within them a positive mark that we don't represent a, an organization that is judging. We don't want to represent an organization that seems like a country club that says, you're out. We want to be positive. Aroma, not only to God, but to this world that draws people in closer to understand the salvific power and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the love of the Father and the peace of the Son and the communion of the Holy Ghost go with you on this day and every day. And as always, go in peace.